Okay, so um, I'll share a little bit about myself. As you all know that I am the host of the virtual tours and I am a group leader for Girl Travel Tours. Um, I live in the United States, specifically between Philadelphia and New York. I started my physical tour program with EF Tours as a Girl Scout leader. And I have grown that um, with international destinations with adults only, as well as um, friends and family trips, which has been great. Um, so during this time, we obviously are not traveling. So um, I started this virtual tour series back in May um, and it's been a hit. So thank you all for coming out um, week after week and, and engaging with us and our new destinations. You know, I really wanted to support the tour director community um, in this time of travel restrictions, they are not working. So I thought this might be a good way for them to come on and share their expertise and also gain some tips along the way. And I really wanted to keep the travel bug and excitement alive for all of us travel enthusiasts. So I think that those two reasons have really helped us uh, with this virtual tour series. Um, and thank you for sharing it with friends and family on social media and other means so that we can keep going week after week. Uh, as you know, we have done several of these tours um, during our COVID shutdown, and we have several more coming up. And um, I put up a slide just now, if you're looking at it, these are our tours that are coming up in 2021. We have Florence and Tuscany next week, followed by World War II and the Western Front, Scandinavia, Notable Women in Santa Fe, Mystery on the Orient Express, uh, Northern Ireland and the Troubles, Iceland, Lucerne in the Alps, Budapest, the Royals, and Ontario and Quebec. That brings us all the way through March. And then we'll look at moving forward into April and May and what we have, um, we're working on some of those right now. As long as you're interested in viewing these virtual tours, we will continue to do them. My tour director friends are loving them and it seems like the audience is loving them. So, so we will continue to put them out as best we can. I know that many of you found us uh, through Facebook and are watching now on Facebook. And I just wanted to, again, send out a big broad warning regarding the scammers on Facebook. You know, I know many of you realize, but hopefully some new people will understand that they are relentless. Please do not give your credit card to enter a free virtual event. My virtual tours are, are, are free. They do not require credit cards and you can safely access them with our Zoom links through girltraveltours.com slash virtual hyphen tours, or you just make sure you are on my Facebook page. But be careful because the scammers have done such a good job. They're not only copying my pages and my events, but they're also copying my, my own photograph and my name and my contact information. So just be careful out there and, and make sure that you're sharing this information with your friends so that nobody gets caught up in this. I know many people have already been caught up in this. My job here, or at least what I'm trying to do here is educate people so that we can prevent more people from being caught up in this. But it's not gonna stop us from doing our virtual tours. You know, I have thought about it over the time and I thought, you know, should we just stop this? No, I think it's our, it's, it's our role to educate people so that they stop, right? Because ultimately they're just gonna continue to, to take advantage of other people. So I just wanna make sure that we spread the word out there. Okay, that's enough about that. Before we get going, I wanted to share a few ways for you to interact with us. On Facebook, I already see the feed going, keep it up, keep your comments moving. Um, but on Zoom, feel free to ask a question that you want the tour director to respond to after the tour in the Q&A. That's what the Q&A is for. If you have a chat that you want me to see, or if you're just sharing something with me, that's fine, you can do that in the chat. But if you have a question that you wanna address after the tour, please put it in the Q&A. The other way that I always like to engage with our friends on Zoom is to launch a poll. This gives us an understanding of what your connection is to the Netherlands and to Amsterdam. The, the answers are, choose one that suits you. I've been and love it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have no set plans, but I'm interested in the destination. Or I am solely interested in experiencing it virtually. If I were checking this, 
I would say I have a trip booked because I have now had a trip booked for more than a year. We were supposed to go last summer, um, right when COVID shut us down. And now we are rebooked for this year. So hopefully everything goes well. And in the end of, um, in the middle of July, I shall be in person seeing some of the sites that we're seeing tonight. Okay, so it looks like most of you are in and have put your results in. So I'm gonna show you the results. It looks like we have 40% of the people who've already been in Love It. That's awesome. That's usually not how these polls go. And then we have a lot of people who are interested in the destination and plan to go in the future. So that's awesome. So that gives us an understanding that um, Yane has a job to do because not only is she sharing this country with you, but now she has to share new and interesting facts with all of you. So that's, that's great to know. Um, so as you know, I mentioned Yane's name. She is our tour director for, for this evening. And a tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour director. A tour director is like a personal concierge who stays with your group from start to finish and shares a world of knowledge, managing all your travel plans and make sure your experience is positive and stressless so that you can take home those lifelong memories and not the hassles that go with it. Yone um, is a colleague of mine, she does tours through Go Ahead Tours and EF Tours, as I do as well. Um, and as you will see through this virtual tour, and if you travel with us in the future, um, tour directors are by far the most important people in our group. If, and as you can imagine, if we're not traveling, our tour directors, they have no work. So I will share with you in the chat as we go along and during the Q&A, how you can tip the tour director if you are so inclined. All tips are optional. We understand that some can and some can't and there is no judgment on our part. We want you to enjoy this virtual tour. Um, let's see, I'm hoping that this virtual tour will not only re-engage you with a city or a destination that you may have known in the future, but also offer new and exciting places for those that have never been. Today, we are lucky to have a tour director who works most of Europe and has spent many years in the Netherlands. I am honored to introduce to you our amazing tour director and my new friend, Yane. Yane, if you are ready, I will stop sharing and you can take over the controls. So I know it's a lot of technology. No. I hope you can hear me. I hope you can yes. see me. You're good. We are good. So if you want to start to share your, your presentation, I'll uh, let you know when it's all coming through and then we're good to move forward. Okay. I will start sharing my screen. There we go. Oh. Is it good? Can you can you see it all right? It's perfect, Yone. Oh, it's going too fast. There we are. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to this tour of Amsterdam and the Netherlands. I am extremely excited to be here with you tonight. And I'm also very grateful. Uh, to have the opportunity to present to you my country of adoption, the Netherlands. Um, I am half Italian, as you can probably hear from my accent, and half Kiwi. My mother is from New Zealand. I was born and raised uh, in Italy, and I moved to the Netherlands uh, 10 years ago when I met a handsome Dutch man who eventually became my husband and the father of my children. Um, as you see uh, in the first uh, slide I'm presenting, um, I gave to this presentation the title of, of a winter tale. Um, when I moved to the Netherlands 10 years ago, 
uh, it was winter, it was January, and uh, I was moving uh, uh, in the province of Friesland, up north. Uh, the province of Friesland looks exactly like this, as you see it in the picture. This is a picture I took uh, myself when I first got there. Um, it was like living in a snow globe. Uh, everything was covered with ice and snow. I remember that we even built an igloo in our backyard. Uh, skies were pale blue and a fierce sun was shining through this flat Dutch horizon. It was really, really magical. Everybody was outside ice skating. This picture that you see now is a picture I took in Amsterdam. This is Kaisersgracht, one of the main canals of the city. And uh, this is how it looked like. Young children, elderly people, men, women, everybody outside in the canal having a good time. So what I was experiencing, I didn't know at the time, it had a name, the ice spread, the joy of the ice. Here you see my best friend in the Netherlands, Lena. Hi, Lena, and a happy birthday if you're following me. Uh, and this is a picture she took uh, just outside Amsterdam when everything was frozen and she was outside skating. So the ice spread, the joy of the ice. Uh, since uh, the 16th century, as we can see in the next slide, here you see this beautiful painting uh, by Hendrik Averkamp, which was made in 1601, and it, which you can admire in the Rijksmuseum. And here it depicts exactly what I'm talking about, the joy of the ice, everybody getting outside and uh, experiencing it, it, it's like a social moment where people would fall in love or also they would make their businesses or anything uh, related to the social life. Um, for me, all this was very exotic. Uh, being Italian, and I've had probably seen the snow maybe four or five times in my whole life. So this was a uh, it was very cold, but yet it was a very warm welcome to the Netherlands. Now, um, I'm showing you here a very interesting event, which is held in Friesland, the province where I was living. It's called the Elfenstedentocht. Um, the 11 city tour. It's a long distance uh, tour skating event, uh, almost 120 miles, and it um, connects 11 cities in Friesland. And it's both uh, for um, uh, co um, competitors and a leisure tour. Uh, about 20,000 people participate to it. It starts and ends in my city, Leo Varden, uh, but it can only take place when the ice is thick enough for obviously for safety reason. So the ice has to be thick all the way through, so for 120 miles, has to be thick at least six inches. Uh, sadly, the last time, time they um, could do this event was in 1997. So I never attended. I'm still waiting uh, that we have uh, the ideal conditions for me to attend uh, this very popular event in the Netherlands. Now, um, some clarification about the name of this country, uh, asking to my friend, the cow expert. Uh, so Holland, uh, first of all, Holland, we normally, many people call it Holland. Holland is not the official name of the country. Holland is the name of two provinces, North Holland and South Holland. The official name of the country is the Netherlands. 
Some others call it the lowlands or the low countries. The lowlands or low countries it has terms that refers to a coastal lowland region in northwestern Europe that forms the lower basin of the three rivers, the Rhine, the Meuse, and the Schelde. And it comprises Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. The Netherlands is made of uh, 12 provinces plus uh, three Caribbean islands, which have the status of uh, municipalities within the nation, which are called uh, Saba, Bonaire, and Saint Eustatius. Um, the country covers a territory of 6,100 square miles, about let's say half the size of Scotland uh, or uh, something slightly bigger than the state of Maryland in the US. You can basically drive uh, from north to south or from east to west uh, within uh, something maybe like three hours. So as you realize the country is very small but it's uh, highly uh, populated. Uh, the population is almost 18 million 17 million and a half. And uh, this makes it the second uh, most largely populated country in Europe with the highest density rate of 500 inhabitants per 13 uh, square miles. It is a very rich country. Uh, after the US, the Netherlands is the world's second largest exporter of food and agricultural product. Here, I'm going to show you, oh, sorry, the map didn't show up, but now you can see it. Here you see the division of the country in the 12 uh, provinces. So as you see, Amsterdam is located in the province of North Holland. So most of our tour tonight is going to be about Amsterdam, but then I will mention a um, few other things uh, or excursions that you can take once you are there. Um, here, some typical Dutch icons. On the right hand side, of course, the windmills. And on the left hand side, you can see the typical Dutch wooden shoes. We call them klompen in Dutch. Um, about 3 million klompen are produced uh, every year in the Netherlands, uh, most of which is for the tourist uh, souvenirs, uh, but still many Dutch people uh, use uh, the klompens, uh, mainly farmers or uh, gardeners, or my father-in-law, Parke Dirk, the ones you see in the picture are my father-in-law Klomp. And I have to say, I've tried them. They are actually very handy and comfortable, especially when you're working outside in the garden in the Netherlands. So sometimes it gets quite muddy and wet. And these shoes actually, uh, they, they keep your feet nice and warm and dried. So try them on. Here, this is a picture I took from the plane uh, in one of my many travels to the Netherlands. There is a motto, there is a saying in the Netherlands. God created the world, but Dutch created the Netherlands. Well, this is undoubtedly true. The Netherlands is a product of human endeavor. And it's made of the so-called polders, strips of firm land separated by canals, created with techniques that drain the wetlands and make them usable for agriculture. There is something like 3,000 polders in this country. The first polders were built in the 11th century and by 1961, so relatively recently, 6,800 square miles, more or less half of the country's land, was reclaimed from the sea. So about half of the total surface area of polders in northwestern Europe is in the Netherlands. Today, almost 1,500 miles of dikes protect the low flat land half of which lies below the sea level from, and, uh, and they protect it from the invasion of the Northern Sea. Here you can see my old school map. 
Uh, and you can see the position of the Netherlands here uh, between Great Britain and Scandinavia. And this is the Northern Sea. Um, in the picture, I'm showing you uh, the, the, the Afslar dike. This is a 20 miles dike that connects uh, the northern province of Friesland uh, to, the nor to North Holland province uh, on either side of the Cider Day. Um, it was built in 1932. So I always found this particularly incredible. The Cider Day was no longer a sea after the uh, dike was built and it was renamed Isolmeer. Meer is the Dutch word for a lake, as the continuing flow of fresh river water flushed out the salt water. On one side of the dike, the, dike, the, the sea became a lake. Now I have the pleasure of introducing you to the royal family. Um, the Dutch monarchy is a constitution, parliamentary constitutional monarchy since 1848, when King Willem II granted a new uh, and more liberal constitution to the people of the Netherlands, making the uh, monarchy a sort of a servant of the elected government. The monarch Willem Alexander acceded the throne after his mother abdication in 2013, and he married um, Maxima Sorridieta Serruti in 2002. Together, they have three daughters: Princesses Amalia, Arianna, and Alexia. Um, the Queen Maxima is the first Argentine-born queen in the history of the Netherlands. When the couple announced on a TV broadcast, uh, on a live TV broadcast, uh, their engagement, Queen Maxima spoke to the Dutch people in Dutch which is not her uh, mother tongue. Since then, the Dutch people simply adored her. Uh, the funniest thing was when I moved to the Netherlands and I started, try to start, uh, you know, speaking in Dutch, uh, which was quite complicated for me. Um, people would encourage me uh, kindly by telling me that I sounded like uh, Queen Maxima, probably because of my Italian accent. My accent didn't sound so royal to me, but it certainly uh, gave me some strength. <laughs> um, little gossip, because we, when we talk about royals, uh, we should always put some gossip in it. Um, Maxim Maxima's parents, her dad and her mother, they could not attend the wedding because uh, uh, Maxima's father had a role as a cabinet minister during the national reorganization process, uh, that is to say the most recent Argentinian dictatorship. And for this reason, they were not uh, allowed allowed to attend uh, the wedding. Uh, by law, the king has to be periodically informed and consulted on governmental affairs, but his role is basically formal. Uh, the current king, Willem Alexander, represents the 11th generation from the era of the, the Dutch king, the first Dutch king, Willem the Silent Prince of Orange. Carrots. <laughs> there is a tale, there is a legend that says that Dutch farmers began to cultivate orange varieties of carrots to mark their respect for the house of oranges, uh, the, the royal house. Um, Orange is indeed the color that represents the Dutch monarchy. This is a very quaint story, but unfortunately it isn't true. So if uh, you ever uh, come to the Netherlands in April, on the 27th of April, the day of the king's birthday, uh, you will be able to attend the Koningsdag. 
uh, the King's Day. Um, the King's Day is one of the biggest and best uh, festivity that celebrates the monarch in Europe. Everybody is outside, it's of course a national holiday. There is mu live music, concerts everywhere, street markets. Uh, people would get up very early in the morning, uh, about 4 or 5 a.m., in order to uh, secure themselves a spot on the street uh, to be able to sell their items. And everything can be sold on that day. Uh, clothes, books, uh, food, drinks. Uh, anything. So make sure if you uh, want to come to the Netherlands, uh, put this date down. Uh, also, the springtime is one of the best periods to visit the Netherlands because it's the season where the tulip uh, are blossoming. Here we have a small overview on the queens of the Netherlands. Um, when uh, Queen Beatrix, uh, King Willem Alexander's mother, abdicated in 2013, she ended more than a century of female reign uh, over the, the, the Netherlands. The most notable queen was Queen Wilhelmina. You see her on the left hand side of the screen. She reigned from 1890 uh, to 1948. She reigned also during the First World War and the Second World War. Um, after Queen Wilhelmina, her daughter, Queen Juliana uh, became Queen of the Netherlands and her reign from, was from 1948 to uh, 1980. In the middle of the screen, you see the Dutch crown. It is interesting to know that Dutch royals are not crowned. Um, they have a ceremony of inauguration, but they don't wear the crown. Here you see on the left hand side, Queen Beatrix, uh, the mother of King Willem Alexander, who was Queen of the Netherlands from 1980 to 2013. And it's time for gossip number two. When she married, when Queen Beatrix married uh, in 1966, uh, she married Klaus von Amsberg, a German nobleman who had been in the Hitler's youth and had served briefly the Nazi army during Second World War. The wedding was a diplomatic disaster uh, under the lead of the Provo movement, uh, a critical mass of Amsterdamers uh, joined the demonstrations against uh, the marriage. Uh, even the mayor of that time, Gijs van Hal, he was forced out of office, so it was a big thing. On the right hand side, you see the sister of Queen Beatrix, Princess Margaret. She has never became a queen, but uh, I would like to mention her story because it is very interesting. Um, she was born in Canada during World War II, as the Dutch royal family had escaped there in June 1940 after the occupation of, uh, of the Netherlands by Nazi Germany. So the maternity ward of the Ottawa City Civil Hospital, where she was born, it was declared extraterritorial in order for the newborn princess to obtain the Dutch citizenship. Otherwise, she would have automatically become a Canadian, and this would have been a problem for a member of the royal family. Since 1945, the Dutch royal family uh, sends uh, 100,000 tulip bulbs to Ottawa in gratitude for what the Canadians did uh, in World War II. And every year in Ottawa, it's, uh, hold, they hold the Tulip Festival. 
Canadian troops uh, liberated the Netherlands uh, in, um, in 1945. Uh, and every, ma uh, every May, every 5th of May, we celebrate the Befreidingsdag, the Liberation Day. Um, just before the liberation, the Netherlands had gone through a terrible time. It is recalled as the hunger winter, the winter of hunger. Um, the Germans uh, had stripped uh, the country of much of its food and resources, leading uh, the people to a mass starvation. People really had nothing better to eat than tulip bulbs. I am now introducing you to the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Mr. Mark Rutte. Um, the executive power in the Netherlands is held by the Dutch cabinet, which is formed by 13 or 16 ministers. And the head of the government is the prime minister, who is a primus inter pares. That is to say that he um, has got no explicit powers beyond the, uh, those of the other ministers. Mark Rutte has been the prime minister of the Netherlands since 2010. I really love this picture for two reasons. First of all, an apple a day takes the doctor away. This is the most effective pharmaceutical drug used by the Dutch together with the paracetamol. Dutch people really don't like to take medicines, especially antibiotics. Rustig blijven en water drinken. Stay calm and drink a lot of water. That was the favorite medical prescription of my family doctor. The second reason why I like this picture is that it shows you that uh, everybody literally in the Netherlands uses the bike. Even the prime minister rides his bike when he goes to work. Here you see some other creative uses of the bicycle. You can use it to carry a Christmas tree or you can do some acrobatic uh, suicidal uh, cycling in the snow, which I would obviously never do because I'm not Dutch. Um, here, now I think we are ready to start our bike tour of uh, the city of Amsterdam. And so to do that, I invite you to pick up uh, a bike. Virtually we can, we're not stealing anything. And I'm showing you a small fraction of the bicycle parking, which is located at the central station. Uh, how do they remember where they've parked their bike is still a mystery to me. The history and the success of the bicycle in Amsterdam started in the 60s with a counter um, cultural movement called the Provo, the Provo movement, a movement that was founded in 1965 and which is a sort of predecessor of the hippie movement. What they did is that they declare a uh, cars to be evil and they invaded the city of Amsterdam with a fleet of uh, um, bikes, white bicycles, making them available for the people to use them. This has led throughout the years to the most sophisticated urban bicycle system of the world with bike lanes, bike light, traffic lights, bike parking, everything. Uh, now, Pick up your bike and let's start cycling around the city of Amsterdam. And believe me if I tell you that the only possible safe way to bike around Amsterdam is doing it virtually. I have made a map to which I will refer every now and then during this tour to give you a sort of an orientation uh, in the city. If you have been already to Amsterdam, you probably are familiar with it. If you have never been, it will help you to orientate yourself a little bit. So our first bike ride will be from Central Station to the Norderkerk and the Jordan district, okay? So 
Here, we have an aerial view of the central station. You see with the uh, writing on it, Amsterdam on the roof. It is very important to know that the people of Amsterdam did not want a central station to be built in that spot. Uh, they thought it would have cut off uh, the city from its waterfront, but uh, there was nothing they could do, and the central station was built uh, there, and it was built uh, by Pierre Kuypers. Here you see behind the tram a building, which if you've been to Amsterdam, it can be confused with the Rijksmuseum because it's the, it's the same architecture. That is because it is also the same architect, Pierre Kuypers. As you stand with your back towards the central station, you are immediately confronted with a chaos of tram and buses and uh, people running around and boat cruises. Uh, now we will move, uh, uh, we will cross the street and take a bike ride, a bike ride along uh, the canals. We are now moving to a quieter area of the canals so where we can admire some gorgeous uh, buildings that remind us about the glorious Dutch Golden Age. Along the path, we will come uh, close to this building. This used to be the headquarter of the West Indish House. Um, and it is now home to a US associated educational institute. You have to pardon me, but I have to take a little detour back in history because it is extremely important for us to understand the history of the West and East India Company. This history is pretty sums up pretty much the history of the city of Amsterdam, the history of the Netherlands, as well as the history of the Western society. I would like to quote a book which I strongly recommend you to read. The book is called Amsterdam, A History of the World's, World's Most Liberal City, and it's written by an American author, Russell Shorto. Um, he says in, in his book, no company in history has had such an impact on the world. It introduced Europe to Asia and Africa. It pioneered and invented the first modern bureaucracy, advanced cartography and shipbuilding, fostered disease, slavery and exploitation on a scale never imagined before, slaughtered entire population. Europe was exploring the world and was ready to exploit, to consume. And the Dutch were on their way to become the greatest shipping nation the world had ever seen. Amsterdam was about to make itself into the Amazon.com of the 17th century, the place where everything was available to everybody. In the 16th century, this country which was called at the time the United Provinces, was indeed the world's only federal republic where a collectivity of town governments committed to the advancement of trade, industry and navigation. Meanwhile, pretty much the rest of Europe was under the feudal system. The merchant fleet of the Dutch East India Company um, was formed in 1602 and quickly became as powerful as a sovereign state with the ability to raise its own armed forces and to establish colonies. In 1621, its sister company, the Dutch West India, came into being and started trading with Africa and the Americas. Uh, becoming also the very center of the slave trade. They discovered and conquered faraway lands, including Tasmania, New Zealand, Malaysia, Sri Lanka. It was an employee of Feo Sei, uh, the East India Dutch Company, an English explorer named Henry Hudson, uh, 
who first landed in the island of Manhattan in 1609. 15 years later, a new ship filled with Dutch settlers arrived in the same portion of the land and named it New Netherland. To the north, they gave the name of Rode Island, Red Island, because from the sea, it looked like if it was red and like if it was an island. And other Dutch names were given, such as Brokelen, Harlem, Staten Island, Long Island, Konijne Island. The capital city's name was then Amsterdam in the New Netherlands. The settlers brought with them uh, a system that was shaped exactly on, this, on the um, Dutch society and especially on the city of Amsterdam. They transported with them their mixed society and the new city grew incredibly cosmopolitan. Imagine that at that time, the city had something like 500 inhabitants and some, 18 different dialects were spoken. They brought with them the tolerance, the liberal, liberalism, and the modernity of Amsterdam and its golden age. The man you see in this picture is Peter Stuyvesant, a Frisian minister's son, who was put in control of the new colony from the West India Company directors in 1647. And during his time, the Dutch authorities gave uh, to New Amsterdam a municipal charter. Later, in 1664, the Dutch agreed to give uh, to the English uh, in New Amsterdam in return for Suriname and the control of the Spice Islands in Indonesia. The English immediately renamed it New York, but Dutch was still the most spoken language and the only European language Indians knew. If you are interested in this, um, uh, in this period of history, I strongly recommend you to visit the Tropen Museum, a beautiful uh, anthropology museum in Amsterdam, where you can learn all about uh, the Dutch colonial activities. After this exotic uh, journey, this exotic time machine journey, uh, we will continue in Viking uh, through the Brouwersgracht, Brewers Canal, a radial canal that cuts across uh, the others and takes its name from the many breweries that were uh, present operating on the, uh, along the banks. This is uh, one of the most beautiful waterway. Um, riding all the way down, we will come to the intersection between the Brewersgracht with the Prinzengracht, and we will enter the beautiful district of the Jordan. Weiss machten naar 88 prachtige nachten bij 88 prachtige grachten. So if you have ever been to Amsterdam and you have taken a city tour, you probably have been tortured by some funny Dutch local guide by having to repeat this tongue twist. Uh, um, here a canal ring aerial view to make you better understand the geography of uh, these uh, uh, iconic uh, canals. Um, in Dutch, canal, as you have uh, just came to understand, is gracht. Uh, the canal ring came to life in the early 1600s after Amsterdam's population grew beyond its medieval walls. Um, it wasn't meant to be picturesque or decorative. The canal ring was necessary uh, to drain and reclaim the waterlogged land. The canal ring is now part since 2013 of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, here you see the canals that were built in the 17th century, uh, if you can follow the arrow of my mouse, uh, you can see that the canals, they wrap in a semicircular shape, the very center of medieval Amsterdam. 
each of the canals was given a fancy name. So we had the single canal, which was built originally to defend Amsterdam city's outer limits, the Heerengracht, um, the gentleman canals that was that where many Amsterdam's wealthy people moved once it was completed. And then we have the Kaisersgracht, um, named after the Emperor Maximilian I. And then we have the Prinzengracht, named after Willem the Silent Prince of Orange, the first Dutch royal. This canal also acted as a sort of barrier against the crusty working class district of the Jordan quarter, uh, which was back in the days uh, the area for the poor people but today is one of the most lively, fancy and expensive district in town. Um, it can be compared a little bit to the Latin Quarter in Paris or to Trasevere district in uh, Rome. Um, the greatest innovation of the Canal Ring uh, is that it wasn't designed, uh, it wasn't made to serve popes or queen, king or king, queens. It was made for individuals, for tradesmen, for merchants, and it was made to serve their ambitions. Now, a view of some of the canal houses. Together with the 12 miles canal side, also 3,000 houses were built in the 1600 on shifting marshland, requiring the work of pile driving by manual labor. A single house required 40 pairs of piles to be jammed 40 or 60 feet in the sand and clay. The canal houses you see in Amsterdam today rest on piles that were rent into the earth in the 1600s. In the map, we will see our next uh, ride from the uh, Northern Markt in the year down all the way down Prinzengracht until we will reach uh, the Westerkerk and the Anne Frank House. In this picture, you see some of the iconic uh, houseboats, and you see at the bottom of the canal uh, the pinnacle of the Western Church. And here you can spot what we call in Dutch. Packhausen, the warehouses, the warehouses of the 17th century. Uh, these buildings are also very famous and they're recognizable from the shuttered windows uh, that they have right in the middle of each floor. So traders uh, would keep their offices on the ground floor of their house, their family would leave behind the office and the, on the upper floor, they would use the upper floor to store the goods that they were trading. Uh, you can still notice upwards in the top of the building, a hook hanging down out of the top back, that back in the days uh, was used to pull up the goods in the upper floor. Nowadays, these hooks are still used to move the furniture of the apartments. What kind of goods could you have found in Amsterdam in the 17th century? Almost everything, pepper, cinnamon, whale oil, sugar, tobacco, beer, uh, soap, silk, Amsterdam was really the largest world emporium. I had mentioned already the houseboats, uh, and here I'm showing you another couple of pictures uh, of uh, uh, these beautiful houseboats of Amsterdam. Dutch were and still are seagoing people. So along these canals, you can find some of the finest and prettiest houseboats in Europe. It is very expensive to live in a houseboat because uh, there aren't many places for moorings. In this, um, here you see in this picture that there is two types of houseboats. Houses that are actually made on actual 
sorry, on actual boats and houses that are sort of floating constructions on water and they cannot sail. On the right hand side, you see these uh, constructions that cannot sail, they are not proper boats. Um, so you see, Amsterdam, when you visit Amsterdam, uh, you will notice uh, that Amsterdam is not a monumental city. It's not like Paris or Rome or London. It's a charming place. Um, and this charming feeling is given by the coziness, the intimacy, the quietness. Um, the Dutch actually kept things intimate, even in the maximum um, splendor of their days. Um, there is that word which I love is one of my favorite and it's very difficult to translate in any other language because it's just typical Dutch and it is gezellig. Gezellig means cozy, reassuring, warm, comfortable. Here other pictures of the sorry of the houseboats and the pack house and in the back with the shuttered windows. And here in this picture, uh, I put this picture in the presentation because I wanted to share with you this funny story. One of the first thing I noticed when I came to the Netherlands, it was that all houses, all the buildings uh, had these huge windows. So I did ask my husband, but what about the privacy? People don't mind that everybody can look inside and see what they're doing. Well, the answer was, well, we Dutch people don't look inside the houses, only Italians do. Okay, <laughs> I did. But the question remains, and there are several answers to it. One, uh, some people say that it's because of the light. In the fall or in the winter, there is a lack of light. So in order to get more light inside the houses, they would have built bigger windows. Some others uh, say that it has to do with the Protestant religion by which people should not have anything to hide. We are almost approaching uh, through the Prinzengracht, this uh, beautiful church that you see here from afar. Look at the quality of light. Um, the sunset in Amsterdam are magical, sunset and sunrises. This church, uh, the Western church, was built in 1631 and it has become the symbol of the district of the Jordan. Rembrandt supposedly lies here in an unmarked pauper's grave. Next, uh, the church on the Prinzegracht Canal, we find the entrance to Anne Frank House. This house where the young uh, Jewish girl Anna Frank, uh, it is the house where she hid with her family from the Nazis from 1942 to 1944. And it is the house where she wrote uh, her diary. Uh, the museum attracts a million of visitors annually. Um, the museum is really well made and it contains a very sober uh, exhibition of the prosecution of the Jews during the war, as well as discrimination in general. Uh, Adolf Hitler troops uh, invaded the Netherlands uh, on May the 10th, uh, 1941. Um, at first, uh, the Dutch uh, tried to defend the country, but after the city of Rotterdam was uh, almost completely bombed and destroyed during an uh, airborne assault by German forces, uh, the Dutch surrendered and the Nazi occupation began. The Germans planned to incorporate the Netherlands into a greater Germany after the war end, and they, because they believed that both ethnic groups uh, descended from the same Aryan stock. In 1940, there were uh, 80,000 Jews living in Amsterdam, today 15,000. Jews in the Netherlands had uh, lowest uh, survival rate in Europe. Only 27% of them survived. 
58,000 Jews, over 80,000, died in concentration camps. There is um, an incredible video on YouTube. Uh, you can easily find it if you Google Anne Frank video on YouTube, where you see the young Anne Frank uh, looking outside of the windows from her house, which wasn't this one, but it was in another part of the city. And she's very happy and excited because down the street, a couple is getting married, is about to go and get married. Um, it, it is quite shocking uh, to know that this video was shot in 1941. So actually, the German occupation had already begun. At the beginning, the Dutch people probably thought that they would have managed, uh, that the Netherlands would have managed to stay neutral during the Second World War, as it had, did happen during the First uh, World War. But it was not uh, obviously uh, the case. Um, between the 20s and the 30s, uh, many Jewish people emigrated uh, to the Netherlands uh, to escape the economic recession, which was hitting hard uh, many countries in Europe, uh, especially Germany. Um, Otto Frank and his father uh, came to live in Amsterdam with his family in 1933. He was a very clever and successful businessman. He was a banker and he had traveled uh, everywhere in the world and he had lots of connection also with the US. Um, the Franks didn't have uh, to, um, to deal with extortionists. That means that they didn't have to pay someone to hide them. They were able to hide in the back of the of this building where uh, the company of for which Otto Frank was working was uh, located. Um, they, as I said, they were hiding here for two years and they were sent to Auschwitz in 1944. Only Otto Frank survived the concentration camp. And when he returned back to Amsterdam, Mip Gies, a former employee of his company, gave him Anna's diary that she wrote uh, during the time that they were hiding in that house. Um, this diary was published in 1947 in the Netherlands, and uh, in 1952 it was published in the US and in England, becoming one of the most widely uh, read books uh, of all time. Exiting the Anne Frank Museum, you will literally step on one of the most poignant monuments hidden in the streets of Amsterdam, the Homo Monument. The three pink granite blocks, um, they symbolize the prosecution of gay men and lesbians during the Nazi uh, occupation. Uh, homosexuals were forced to wear a pink triangle patch. So that's what uh, inspired this monument. Uh, um, the alignments of the three uh, points, uh, uh, it's very symbolic. On one side, uh, it uh, points toward the National War Memorial on Dam Square, where we are about to go. The other point uh, is towards the Anna Frank House, another victim of the Nazi prosecution. And the third point is directed towards the headquarters of the Say Oh Say, uh, which was the first uh, uh, association for gay rights uh, founded in the Netherlands in 1946 by Otto Prenzler, an homosexual intellectual who has meant a lot for the acquisition of civil rights in the post Netherlands. In 1964, he participated to a TV show declaring that as he was forced to hide being a Jew during the Nazi occupation, he would have never hide again. Uh, he promised to me himself that he would have never hide again. 
Before we head towards the Dam Square, I would like to tell you that there are lots of places uh, uh, where you can have a snack or a drink in this area. Uh, lots of terrace uh, places where you can go and sit outside, especially if it's a sunny day and enjoy. Um, here you have a picture of the so-called brown cafe and of course a beertje. Beertje is the Dutch word for small beer. Dutch people are real beer lovers. Uh, beer is a drink for parties and spending time together. Most Dutch beer is Pilsner Heineken is, of course, uh, the Netherlands' West best known beer, but there are also other brands uh, such as Emsel, Gronsch, Oranjebaum. La Trap is the only Dutch Trappist beer. As we shall never drink uh, with an empty stomach, uh, here I'm <laughs> proposing you some uh, winter recipes. Snet or Erten soup pea soup with sausage and stamp pot um, made with smashed potatoes, veggies and pork. Contrary to what people may think, and don't forget I'm Italian, so food for me is a kind of religion, Dutch cuisine is very tasty and healthy. Look at the picture of this beautiful Northern Sea Salem and the typical, sorry, and the typical Dutch cabbage, which is called the buronko, which they use uh, for their stamp pots. Just outside the, the Western Church, there's some stalls who would serve you some fish snacks. I always like to challenge my groups by going there and having them trying the herrings. You can eat it like this with chopped onion, onions on a plate, or you can eat it like this, the Dutch way. Some other fish snacks that you may want to try is the smoked eel. Here you see my friend Rulof smoking the eel himself. Lekker, lekker, lekker. Lekker is the Dutch word for good. I love it. Um, now we'll go back to the map and I'm going to show you our next ride that goes from the Western Church in the very center of Amsterdam, the Dam Square. Going down the Radhausstraat, we will pass by the Magna Plaza Mall. It is a department store built in an old of post office building dating back 1908. It is also called the Pier Mountain because of the pier shaped decoration on its towers. Here from the north we come to the Dam Square, uh, the most famous uh, square of Amsterdam. Um, the dam derives its name from its original function. It was a dam built on the Amstel River, approximately around 1270, uh, which formed a connection between the settlements on the sides of the river. This dam would eventually give the community the name Amselredam, the dam across the Amsel River. Uh, today, it's still a very important national gathering spot. And is, if there is a major speech or event is held here. Uh, also tragic events occurred in the square. On May the 7th, 1945, to celebrate the end of World War II, Dutch people gathered in the square, but German troops hadn't left yet, and they opened uh, the fire on the people, killing about 33 of them. Shortly after, the Canadian forces arrived uh, and take over the city in behalf of the Allies. Here you see the obelisk uh, that's uh, on uh, Dam Square. Uh, it, the obelisk is a national <clears throat> monument and it was built in 1956 to 
commemorate World War II's uh, fallen. Um, and the, the monument is the focus of a memorial ceremony, which is held every year on the 4th of May, when the king places a wreath uh, on it. This 72 feet obelisk uh, um, is embedded with three sculptures. Uh, on one side, you have war symbolized uh, by four male figures. Then you have peace represented by a woman and a child, and then resistance represented by two men with two howling dogs flanked by two stone lions that symbolize the Netherlands. From the Dam Square, uh, you can walk uh, all around the Dam Square. There are pedestrian streets where you can enjoy the shopping. Here you see in another perspective of the square, the Damrak, the road that connects uh, the Dam Square with the central station. We took a detour, we went along the canals, but if you want, you can walk. You see the central station right there at the end of the street uh, in the very back of the picture. That's the central station. So you can walk from the station to Dam Square in let's say less uh, than 10 minutes. Um, on the Dam Square, you will see this beautiful building, the Royal Palace, which was built as a city hall between 1648 and 1655. Um, a sculpture on the rooftop symbolizes Atlas shouldering the globe. It became a royal palace in 1808 under Louis, uh, King Louis, Bonaparte's brother, who ruled the land at that time. Uh, while the palace is the official uh, residence of the monarch, uh, the Dutch royals don't live in, the, in this palace. They use, it, you, they use it only for ceremonies. In the square, you will also find this beautiful department it's called the Bayenkorf. Uh, it means a beehive. It is a luxury department store on six floors built in 1870. And it was also declared as a national monument. Here are some other little side streets around the Dam Square with pubs, coffee shops, <laughs> and some other streets uh, that you can enjoy. So if you look at the map, now we are going from the Dam Square down south towards what's called the Spau. Um, before we get to the Spau, uh, no, on, on the way, sorry, on the way to the Spau, we, on a street which is called the Spaustraat, we will find the Amsterdam Museum. On the Spaustraat, uh, um, there is uh, the entrance to the museum, which shows this multimedia exhibit about the 1000 years history of the city. On the lower, lower floor, you will find uh, religious artifacts, uh, porcelain, and also a painting, a Rembrandt painting, the Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Raymond. Not to be confused with the more famous Anatomy Lesson painted by Rembrandt, uh, the Anatomy Lesson of the Turtup, uh, which is at the Rijksmuseum. I will show a picture later on. Um, after close by the Amsterdam Museum, you will also find the entrance to the Begainhof. Um, the Begainhof is a veiled courtyard of tiny houses and gardens, which was built in the 14th century to uh, host the Catholic sisterhood of the Begains. Uh, these were not nouns uh, and they did not, didn't live in seclusions, but they had um, to make the vow of chastity uh, and they had to be unmarried. They could renounce their vows anytime and leave the Beginov whenever they wanted. Um, there are two churches hidden here, a clandestine chapel built in uh, 1671 where the Begains were shipped in secret from the capital Calvinist, and the English church from 1392, where the Puritans congregated. 
In the medieval uh, time, Amsterdam uh, was a place of pilgrimage. In 1345, 1345, in Amsterdam occurred a miracle that made the city very famous all over Europe. So the story, it is told that a man who was about to die in his house was given the Holy Communion. Immediately after he received the host of the Holy Communion, he vomited. And uh, um, the, the, the Eucharist that came out of his mouth was still whole. So in panic, the people threw the host on the fire, but it did not burn. It was declared to be a miracle and on the man's house was built a small church. Later on, the, the, the church burned down not once but twice and the host again survived the fire. So the miracle of Amsterdam really became a sort of a medieval phenomenon. Now from the spa, we will take this long bike ride all the way down south until we reach the museum district, Museum Plain. Before we get there, I would like to mention, oh, sorry, let me go back to the map, because I would like to mention to you this beautiful, uh, cozy district, uh, if you can see uh, the arrow. But anyway, it's called the Nagen Straches. It's, uh, you see where the, uh, it's written spa on the left hand side. It's a bunch of little streets, nine streets, uh, which is uh, full of uh, little cozy shops that sell fashion, vintage items, uh, antiques. Uh, here is a picture of the uh, one of those streets uh, of the Nagen Straches, the nine streets. Uh, and here is one of these uh, typical shops uh, you can find there. Uh, so, finally, we uh, have arrived to uh, one of the most famous uh, quarter of the town, the museum quarter. Um, from this aerial view, you can see uh, the main building. Oh, now I see the arrow again. There it is. Here, the first main building on the pictures, that is the Rights Museum. Further down, close to the park, you see this round shape uh, building, uh, which is the Van Gogh Museum. Close to the Van Gogh Museum, you see the Stedelijk Museum, and opposite to the Rijks Museum, at the other side of the square, you see the Concertgebouw. So let's have a closer look to these wonderful museums. Let's not forget about our winter tale. So this is the this is how the Rijksmuseum looks in the winter. They put this big ice skating pond uh, and the square looks exactly like this. The Rijksmuseum is one of Amsterdam's grandest and most popular museum. King Louis Bonaparte in 1808 moved the, the collection of the Dutch Golden Age from uh, Den Haag, where it was hosted, back to Amsterdam and placed it on the top floor of the Royal Palace on the Dam Square. In 1878, a design contest was held to, to find the architect that would finally provide a suitable and permanent residence to this amazing art collection. And Pierre Kuypers, the same architect of the Central Station, if you remember, he won the competition. The museum opened in 1885 and uh, it has become one of the most recognizable icons of the city. Um, the vast collection of the Rijksmuseum includes a variety of artifacts and reflects more than 800 years of uh, Dutch history. Uh, amongst the work of Rembrandt, uh, other Dutch great artists are shown in the museum, such as Vermeer, where his famous kitchen maid painting is uh, present. 
another very probably the most famous painting of the Rijksmuseum is the Rembrandt Night Watch. Um, this painting has made Rembrandt a national hero, unfortunately not while he was alive, uh, but it is uh, beautifully placed in a hole on its own and it really allows you to enjoy every tiny little detail. Other incredible things that you can admire in the Rijks Museum are things like this, the doll's house, uh, dating back the 17th century, together with some other precious Delft ware pottery collection. This is the anatomy lesson of Dr. Taup that I mentioned before when we were at the Amsterdam Museum. And now we will move uh, to the Van Gogh Museum. Um, in 1905, the Stedelijk Museum, which is the Museum for Contemporary Art, hold the first exhibition of the works of Vincent Van Gogh, who died uh, only 15 years before. He wasn't well considered in his hometown. Uh, if you go to Amsterdam and you look for Vincent van Gogh-Straat, you will be amazed to understand that this street, it exists, there is a Vincent van Gogh-Straat in Amsterdam, but it's one of the humblest, uh, one of the poorest streets in the city. I always thought it was, it was really you know, funny, uh, as Van Gogh is the most famous Dutch artist uh, in the world. Anyway, the Van Gogh Museum uh, um, collects uh, a lot of these works, uh, more than 200 paintings, 500 drawings, uh, and 700 of his uh, letters. Um, the museum was opened in 1973, and uh, uh, you can admire his uh, beautiful artworks, such as the sunflowers or the bedroom, the potato eaters, uh, or the skeleton with the burning cigarette. Uh, in, um, together with the Van Gogh Museum, it was built uh, this wing, uh, which uh, they call uh, the muscle, built by the designer Kisho Kurosawa, where they uh, hold uh, uh, top art exhibition as well. Close to the Van Gogh Museum, as I said before, uh, you see the concert Gebouw. Uh, you see it in the back of the picture. There you see the facade, and here you see the beautiful interior. The Dutch term uh, concert Gebouw, translated into English, means the concert building. It was opened in 1888, and it has got an amazing acoustic that placed him among the best concert halls in the world. The bathtub, the Stedelijk Museum. Last but not least, this museum was opened in 1895 and it's the largest Dutch museum dedicated to modern and contemporary art. Karl Apple, Cezanne, Chagall, Kandinsky, Matisse, Picasso, Pollock, Worrell, all of the greatest, some of the greatest contemporary artists are displayed in the museum. So if you love contemporary art, this is a museum that you should not be missing. Time to get back on our bikes and move to the east. We will bike back uh, towards the flower market, Blumenmarkt. Um, the Amsterdam flower market, uh, here you can find uh, tulips and flowers of all colors and all sorts. Uh, if you want to buy tulips, uh, just make sure that they have a custom cleared stamp on the packet so you won't have troubles uh, at taking them back home. Uh, the market flows on these canals since 1860 when gardeners uh, used to sell up the river Amstel uh, to sell uh, from, directly from their boats. 
close by the flower market, there is Rembrandt Plain. Uh, this square dedicated to Rembrandt hosts this bronze cast representation of the Night Watch. Here on this square, you can find uh, cafes and restaurants with food from all over the world. Uh, Japanese, Chinese, Italian, um, very popular and very lekker, good in the Netherlands is the Indonesian food, legacy of the colonial era, of course. Speaking about food, uh, here you see the pancakes, lekker, or the cheese. Um, don't forget that the majority of the cheese sold in the Netherlands is Gouda cheese. Old, very old, very, very, very old or young or very, very, very young, but it is the same sort of cheese, the Gouda cheese. Other Dutch delicacies include on the right hand side uh, uh, legendary strop waffles, uh, it's kind of addictive cookies that you can't stop eating. And on the left hand side, I decided to insert this picture. Uh, we call it Beschuit met Nashes, uh, and it's a Dutch tradition when a baby is born and you go to visit uh, the newborn baby, uh, they will offer you this uh, bread, the hard roasted bread with uh, these anise sprinkles on top. Pink if it's a girl and blue if it's a boy. And according to the tradition or to the superstition, anise uh, helps uh, the lactation, so helps the breastfeeding. That's why they eat uh, this uh, when a newborn baby comes. From the flower market, we are heading now uh, east uh, towards the Jewish Historical uh, Museum. But along the way, we will cross uh, the river Emsel. Here you see a picture of the Maharebrug, the skinny bridge. Uh, the Skinny Bridge uh, was built here first in 1670. It's very popular. Many uh, Dutch people would go there to take their wedding pictures. Uh, at night, is illuminated by 1200 lights and it's still hand operated, operated by hand. Um, along the Amstel, here you see another picture of the River Emso. So along the Emso, we will also pass by the Hermitage Museum, the Dutch branch of world famous Hermitage in St. Petersburg, portraying Russian history and culture. Uh, Tsar Peter had a special relationship with Amsterdam because he had lived in the city for several years. Back in the days, they used to offer visitors a shot of a free shot of vodka. Unfortunately, they don't do that anymore. Here you see the National Opera Ballet, uh, a building opened in 1986. And here we finally arrive to the Jewish Historical Museum. Um, this museum is located in the center of Amsterdam's former Jewish quarter. Uh, it reveals the history of the Jews in the Netherlands, uh, capturing the vivid community, which was practically erased uh, during World War II. In 1492, in Spain and Portugal, uh, a huge diaspora happened uh, after defeat of, uh, the defeat of the Muslim in Spain, and they ejected something like 100,000 Jews. Um, the Jews were attracted uh, from the Dutch Republic, which at the time was in the middle of the War of Independence against Spain. They were attracted from the Dutch society because uh, they were traders, and also because in the Netherlands, uh, uh, in Amsterdam, especially in Amsterdam, uh, it, it was already a tolerant place. In 1619, the Jews that came to live in Amsterdam, they were also allowed to practice their faith in the open. 
I would like to mention as well one of the greatest philosophers of all times. His name is Baruch Spinoza, and he was born in Amsterdam in 1632. He was contemporary to Rembrandt. He was a Sephardic Jew born in a family of merchants. Spinoza is the first philosopher of modernity. He has been incredibly influential and important in the history of modern philosophy. He first argued that religion and politics should be divided. And for first he investigated the realm of individual freedom and democracy. Um, in 1670, Spinoza published the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, stating that democracy is, of all forms of government, the most natural consonant with individual liberty, and described the city of Amsterdam as a place where men of every nation and religion would live together in the greatest harmony. In the same neighborhood, uh, there is also the Dutch Resistance Museum that tells the story of the Verset, the Dutch Resistance uh, uh, during uh, uh, the Nazi occupation in World War II. The museum explains how the illegal press operated and how thousands of Jewish people were kept hiding. Resistance in the Netherlands took many forms, uh, such as spying for the Allies, uh, helping people to hide, distributing uh, illegal newspapers to keep the people informed. Um, the museum uh, documents a variety of these activities uh, in a very moving uh, way. Um, there is a beautiful movie, if you are interested, in the Dutch resistance. It's called The Banker, and it tells the story of uh, Wally van Hal a Dutch banker, uh, hero of the resistance. Close by, you will also find Rembrandt House. Um, Rembrandt van Rijn was born in Leiden uh, and he moved to Amsterdam in 1631 at the age of 20. In Amsterdam, he met his wife, Saskia. He became very famous, uh, especially for the self-portrait genre. Here I'm showing you one of his famous self-portrait. Between the age of 20 and 25, he had already painted at least 20 of these uh, self portraits. He was a master of uh, realism and he had a breathtaking capability of capturing uh, the, the light and the dark and especially the personalities, the moods of the people that he was um, portraying, their facial expressions and their poses. This picture shows a part of the interior of Rembrandt's house. Uh, it's quite funny when you go inside. This is his bed, and then you see the size of his bed. And you know, Dutch people are you now they're famous to be very tall people. And, but when you see the size of this bed, you get confused because it's really, really small. Um, the house is located just off of Waterloplein uh, and the museum is dedicated to the life and to the work of Rembrandt. Um, Rembrandt wasn't famous to have a good temperament. He often, he wasn't good at public relationship. He had uh, very often, he had fights about money and commissions and he was also uh, kind of unlucky in his personal life he had three children with his wife that died at a very young age and his wife Saskia died while she was given birth to the first uh, child the child survived she died Rembrandt he didn't marry it again but he um, had another companion a woman who took care of the baby. After some years, uh, he uh, fell in love with another woman and he uh, slowly went bankrupt. Uh, so uh, he even sold uh, the grave of his wife uh, Saskia to make some money. So that tells a lot. Um, when his son died at the age of 26, uh, and he died shortly after. 
uh, as I said, uh, very poor. That's why he's buried in the Western church and there isn't even, uh, uh, we don't even know exactly where he's buried because he's buried in a, in a pauper's grave. Now, here comes troubles. From the Jewish Historic Museum, we will bike uh, to the famous, infamous, scandalous, uh, uh, shocking district uh, of the Wallen. The Dutch name of the red light district is the Wallen. Along the way, we will be able to spot uh, this incredible Buddhist temple. Uh, it was uh, inaugurated in the year 2000, and it was uh, built by a few prominent uh, Chinese entrepreneurs that asked the permission to the city of Amsterdam, and uh, they, they obtained the permission to build this temple. There is a Dutch word, uh, that will help us uh, to understand uh, why in the Netherlands uh, uh, soft drugs and prostitution have been kind of legalized. And that word is gedogen. Gedogen means tolerated. When it comes to marijuana, marijuana's trade is technically illegal, but officially tolerated. They call it a gap, a gap in the system. As an Italian, I do understand these gaps pretty well. I don't have much problems <laughs> with them, uh, but uh, it, it does sound a little strange, a little crazy. Uh, Dutch people aren't crazy at all. Dutch people are very quiet, are very sometimes even conservative. They are organized, they are precise, they have meetings, they have agendas, they plan, they schedule, ev they schedule everything. But they are very practical and they believe that it is better uh, to legalize activities that would happen anyways uh, and maybe earning some money out of it because all these activities, they pay taxes, coffee shop, uh, the prostitutes and so on. So how did they handle the marijuana trade? In 1973, the government decided to treat marijuana the same way as alcohol. This wasn't easy to handle. Uh, so they came up with a very creative solution, as always. Um, since there was already a distinction between cafes, um, which had the license to sell alcohol and coffee shop that were selling coffee and they didn't have the license to sell alcohol, the trade of marijuana moved indoor in the coffee shop. And so it began the handling of this new delicacy. Let's call it like that. In the end of the 80s, the city had 1,500 coffee shop and it became the center, the paradise for EPs from all over the world. Before the COVID crisis, uh, something like 1.5 million tourists uh, had visited coffee shops in Amsterdam. In this picture, you see uh, the iconic uh, windows of the red light district. Some stereotypes about this uh, area are true. There are plenty of sex shops, peep shows, brothels, a sex museum, prostitutes in red light windows. It is strictly forbidden to take photos of the women and there is a 24 hours video surveillance in most part of the district. So don't even try because you can get arrested. Um, the first prostitute window appeared in the Valent in 1960s. Um, today, there are some hundreds of windows in the red light district. Um, also, uh, the, the prostitutes in the 80s, uh, they decided to organize themselves and they start fighting to have their jobs legally legalized, recognized. And that happened in the year 2000. 
um, there is a small narrow alley in the uh, Amsterdam red light district, which is called Trompetersberg. This alley is situated in the middle of the district. It is, it is undoubtedly the most busy narrow alley of Europe. Um, in the middle of the red light district, you will also find the Oude Kerk, the oldest church of Amsterdam, dating back 1250 and incongruously located in the red light district. So from the red light district, we will now head back to the central station where our uh, bike ride has started. But before we get there, let me show you this church, St. Nicholas Church. The church was built in 1885 and it is dedicated to the most uh, famous saint of the Netherlands. Here he is, Sinterklaas. Sinterklaas is the hero of Dutch children. He comes every year on the 5th of December bringing them presents. He is even more popular than Santa Claus. When he comes, he brings with them with him the paper note and this typical Dutch cookies and the, his assistant, the Zwarte Piet. Actually, this picture is a picture I took myself because I have these Lego puppets at home. So at the time, the Piet was still Zwarte, black. Now it changed. There were many protests because this uh, was uh, accused of being racist, uh, that it reminded somehow of the uh, colonial past. And nowadays the peat is not black anymore. But we have all different colors of peat. So I apologize if I put a black one, but that's the only one I had for this presentation. Now, Technically, our bike tour is finished, but I need to mention these wonderful buildings uh, all around the central station on the Eye Canal and on the Eastern Docklands. I'm going to show them to you very fast, but I would just want to make sure you know that they exist because it's really worth to, uh, to, to see them. The best way to enjoy this, uh, this um, pieces of contemporary architecture is by taking a canal cruise, even better, a dinner canal cruise that will take you back to the center of Amsterdam as we did now together, but also in this new part. Here, for instance, you see this beautiful museum. It's called Nemo, it's the science museum made by an <coughs> Italian architect, Renzo Piano. In this picture, you see another uh, perspective of the Nemo Science Museum. And on the right-hand side, uh, the Bee Mouse, a beautiful concert hall, um, where you can, very good for jazz music. Here you see the Schreibfahrt Museum, the shipbuilding museum with a replica of one of the boats of the sailing boats that was used uh, by the Dutch East India or and West India Company from the 16th century. Here you see the Palace of Justice built in 2013. And here two pictures of the Eiffel Museum here and here. The Eiffel Museum opened in the 2012 and contains more than 50,000 Dutch and international films. The Silodam completed in 2002. It's a block that accommodates a variety of homes, offices, where um, elderly residents live together with local artists is a very also interesting uh, urbanistic experiment. On the Eye Canal, you can also find an abandoned Russian submarine or this very funny hotel in a boat, which is called the Boat Hell. So, 
now I'm going to give you a quick overview of some beautiful excursions you can take uh, from Amsterdam. As I said, the Netherlands are is a small country, so you, within an hour or two, you can drive and you can visit many other beautiful, beautiful uh, cities that maybe are less uh, uh, known than Amsterdam, but totally worth visiting. Uh, I cannot present them all, but I will uh, show you, for instance, a little bit of the city of Delft. Uh, Delft is about one hour driving, one hour and 30 minutes driving from Amsterdam. Amsterdam, and it's worldwide famous for the precious, beautiful pottery, the white and blue Delft pottery. It was founded in the year 11, around the year 1100, and it grew very rich uh, thanks to the trade in the 13th and 14th century. Um, in the 17th century, artisans started to produce the famous Delftware, which was uh, nothing than a replica of the Chinese porcelain. Uh, so as you see, back once upon a time, we were copying from the Chinese. Uh, Delftware continues to be produced today, and the town is also famous for the technological university that attracts the students from all over Europe. In Delft, also uh, one of the most uh, other most <laughs> famous Dutch uh, artist, uh, Johannes Vermeer, was born, and he lived here his whole life. He painted the very famous painting of the girl with the pearl earring. There is also a beautiful anonymous movie, The Girl with the Pearl Earring, that tells the story of the life of Johannes Vermeer. In Delft, you can also learn more about the Dutch royals, and especially about the history of William Silent, Prince of Orange, as I said many times, the first Dutch king, who is buried in the new church in Delft, together with the rest of the members of the House of Orange since 1584. Another beautiful excursion that you can take from Amsterdam is in the springtime in the month of April and May is in Lis to the very famous Kokenhof Gardens, where you can have my seven million flowers bulbs over 32 acres. We still haven't mentioned the, the famous tulip mania. Here, the, some of these very famous uh, aerial view of the blossoming uh, tulip fields uh, in the Netherlands. So tulips uh, originally uh, are not from the Netherlands. Tulips, uh, they come from the Ottoman Empire and they were being brought back to the Netherlands from the Netherlands ambassador who was visiting Turkey. Um, in 1593, a very famous botanist named Carolus Clausius began to cultivate these flowers and also to experiment with them. The fame of this beautiful uh, flower spread very rapidly and the flower was immediately popular especially within the upper classes. It became a sort of a status symbol, eh? a luxury item that everybody wanted to have. Uh, people were willing to pay a huge amount of money for a single bulb and the price rose and rose constantly. So in 1633, the stock exchanges were established to trade in bulbs. And despite the warnings of the authorities and uh, to limit this, uh, what it had become a craziness, uh, the trade blossomed and people started selling lands, houses and valuable objects in order to invest in the tulip bulbs. Sadly enough, but predictable, in 1637, the market collapsed, leaving most of the traders with uh, nothing more than a bunch of uh, flowers. 
Today, when we say tulip mania or tulip madness, uh, we uh, refer to a large economic bubble uh, that cannot last. Anyways, uh, the Dutch still love their flowers, the tulip, uh, uh, and the Dutch tulip growers still dominate the bulb industry. Uh, they produce uh, something like four um, billion tulip bulbs each year. 53% of which are grown into uh, cut flowers. This is a picture I took in Alsmeer, where the famous flower auction takes place. Also very interesting to visit. And I am about to end this tour, uh, not without mentioning the very famous Sans Schrantz, these uh, windmills, uh, national Dutch uh, icons. The first uh, used in the 13th century, these windmills pumped the water up and over the dikes from land below the sea level. On the banks of the Sand River, um, six operating mills are completely completely authentic, original, are open to the public uh, to be visited. And um, the Sans Schrantz uh, uh, is also seven museum and is one of the most popular tourist attraction of the Netherlands. This is my last uh, picture. It's a picture I took I took uh, in the island uh, in the province of Friesland, uh, where I was living since a little while ago, the island of Schirmonikoch. And with this picture, which is very special to me, I uh, would like to say thank you to all of you for having uh, joined my tour. Thank you, Livel. Grazie. Well, thank you. Thank you, Yone. That was amazing and excellent. It was extremely historic. It was thorough. It had all the different aspects of a tour that we all love. So thank you. Um, as most of you know, uh, when we physically go on tours, these are educational tours and we do our best to simulate what an educational tour is like through presentation. So I really appreciate Yone for, for you to give us um, not only the history, but the food, the fun stops, the bike rides. It was really, really wonderful. And thank you for simulating that. Um, as I share with you all on a slide, how you can tip Yane, if you are so inclined. Yane, I'd like you to push over to the Q and A um, yes. tab and open that up if you can. And we will try to get through as many questions as we can in the Q and A. Um, you could start at the top and do your best to uh, get through some of them and I will try to to monitor them as we go and take out the duplicates and, and things like that. So if you're ready, when you're ready, we can go over. But before you get started, I just want to say thank you for all of the attendees, um, both on Facebook and on Zoom. We really appreciate you and, and please know that these tours would not be possible with all, without all of you. I know that you appreciate the tours as well. So it's a win-win-win situation. Um, the tour directors love it and you guys love it. So thanks again for joining us. But we're gonna dive into the Q&A, which is always a favorite spot of the tour for me because I think it really does bring out the personality of the tour director and it also brings some hidden gems that might not have been mentioned on the tour or were mentioned um, more quickly. So if you're ready, Yone, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push it back over to you and you could start with the questions. Sure. Um, thank you, Mara, first of all, thank you, <laughs> sincerely. Uh, and thank you all for these uh, nice comments I'm reading. It, it, it re you don't imagine how I how happy I am, uh, you know, to be back, even if it's virtual, to what I love to do the most. Um, so, first question I see here: Do the canal freeze over? Yes, they do. Yes, they do, and you can actually skate on the canals. Actually, skating on the canals replace bicycle uh, during the winter. In the old days, children would go ice skating to school on these wooden skates. 
Could you please repeat the name of the artist of the first painting you showed? I think the, the early 1600s. Um, that is the ice bread, uh, that was depicting the ice bread, the joy of the ice. And it was a painting of Hendrik Haverkamp. It's in the Rijks Museum. Um, do houseboats stay in the canals of in the winters? Yes, they do. Most of the houseboats that you see in Amsterdam, even if there are actual boats and they could be able to sail, they never move. They stay where they are, most of them. Are the wooden shoes warm? Don't ask that to an Italian. No, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> for my father-in-law, they're perfectly warm and comfortable. It's a little bit up to you. I see Maastricht. Isn't that where Andre Rue is from? Yes, absolutely. Maastricht, what a beautiful city. I didn't have the time to mention it all, but Maastricht is beautiful. I, I, well, okay, I, I can talk another hour about Maastricht, but it's a wonderful place. Um, are the polders used to reclaim agricultural land or for residential development? Mostly to reclaim agricultural land. What is the role of king and queen? Uh, the role of king and queen it's a representative role. It's like the Dutch diplomacy. They would attend ceremonies all around the globe, but they don't take decisions. And the decisions are taken by the Dutch cabinet. Um, why are the people and language called the Dutch? Well, this, this has um, a medieval origin. It comes uh, uh, from a Germanic dialect, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, who will become, uh, sorry, who will be the next king, queen of the Netherlands after Willem? Supposedly one of his three daughters. Were there no sons, older brothers to the queens? Or does succession go to the oldest child? Technically, yes, but there can be other choices uh, they can be made. What are linguistical roots of the country's spoken language? Germanic, Scandinavian, Viking. Um, Dutch is a mix of German and English, but uh, I didn't tell you, and it is uh, interesting. In the Netherlands, there is another official language, which is the Frisian language spoken in the province of uh, uh, Friesland, which is more similar to probably to Scandinavian languages. Uh, where does Ottawa Tulip Festival take place? Uh, um, this I don't know. I, the pictures I've shown, it was in front, I think, the Parliament House in Ottawa. So I think all, all over the city, but I am not sure about that. I'm sorry, because I've never been I want to go, but I will eventually. Um, do you do day tours of Amsterdam? We will be there before a river cruise and would like to personalize the tour of the city. I, I, yeah, if I'm in Amsterdam, I'll be happy to lead a private tour, of course. Um, why did Canada liberate them rather than other allied forces? No, just because First, uh, Canadian troops uh, came, break, uh, broke through the Netherlands, but they were together, working together with the other allied forces. And there is a strong bond, there is a strong friendship between uh, Dutch people and Canadians. How did they get the bikes up to the top row of the bike parking? <laughs> with uh, sport, uh, muscles. <laughs> training a lot. Could you talk? Uh, the central bike station is amazing. How many bikes can park there? The exact number, I don't know. Thousands, thousands of bikes. What 
is the name of the US-based organization that now occupies the West India Company buildings near the central station. Uh, the exact name, I don't know. I only know that is uh, um, an educational building, uh, but I don't know the exact name of it. Ah, what was the name and author of the book uh, I recommend? Russell Shorter, the name of the author, and the name of the book is Amsterdam, the history of the most liberal city. What is the best time to take a river tour to see tulips? Definitely to see the tulips, you have to be in the Netherlands uh, between April and May, because that's when the tulip blossom. What is the difference between Holland and the Netherlands? The Netherlands is the name of the whole country. Holland is the name of two provinces of the whole country, North Holland and South Holland. The Ding single, I think it was meant, single and other canals don't seem to drain anywhere, do they? Uh, I No, yeah, no, I think they don't. Are Amsterdam 16th century buildings sinking into the canals, like the buildings in Venice? Um, the Dutch certainly do a better job than what we do in, the, in Italy uh, with keeping, uh, you know, the, the, the cities from flooding. Uh, but no, they're not sinking. They they are not straight because they're on, a, you know marsh uh, territory so they they are not quite straight but they are not uh, sinking actually they're not sinking in venice uh, as well it's the water the level of water is rising but the building are uh, always at the same uh, level uh, are there residents uh, warehouses now occupied my families yes Yes, and very expensive to live there, especially around the, the canals. Uh, advantages on about living on a boat. Um, well, if you can move with your boat, the advantage is that you don't have to have a car. By boat, you can move everywhere in Amsterdam, but not with a houseboat because it is too big. But I tell you, many Dutch people, if they can, and if they live close by the water, they will have a small boat to move around. Also because the parking of the car is crazy. It's about eight euros per hour, I think, now this year. Are there many elevators in a typical home? No, especially in the center, there are no elevators. There is the old stair, tiny and most dangerous uh, round staircase that you can imagine. Museum of the Resistance, please mention it. It is exceptionally well done and more than worth, yeah, yeah, that Frisset Museum, I've mentioned it, absolutely. Very, very interesting. Uh, can people live in houseboats all winter? Do the Amsterdam canals freeze? Uh, yes, people live in the houseboats in the winter. Do you prefer Heineken or Grosch? Uh, Grosch. <laughs> Free, uh, okay, please describe the typical Dutch breakfast, lunch and dinner. So yes, okay, breakfast, uh, they would eat some cereals, yogurt, they eat a lot of milk products in the Netherlands because they have a lot of cows and they produce a lot of milk and dairies. So uh, yogurt, milk, uh, cereals, uh, um, they would also have some bread uh, with bread and butter, salami, cheese, they have quite a big breakfast. For lunch, uh, lunch is quick and light probably a sandwich or a salad or something like that. And for dinner, they call it the warme eten, the hot meal, because it means that it's cooked. So the dinner is the meal that is mostly cooked and usually is some meat, potatoes, uh, because they eat a lot of potatoes, 
the potato eaters from Van Gogh, you remember, and with some veggies, uh, some salad or some workol or some peas. Uh, which area in Amsterdam would you suggest uh, a tourist to stay? Um, I think uh, the Jordan is a very beautiful uh, district. Uh, it's very close to the center. It's very picturesque. Uh, and from there you can get uh, everywhere. I would definitely recommend, and it's also a little quieter area of the city. Is there a national religion? Uh, Religion is, be, is a troubled uh, uh, history, the history of religion in the Netherlands, because they had uh, many centuries of wars between Protestants and Catholics. Uh, um, after all these uh, uh, dramatic circumstances that the countries have gone through, uh, the result is that nowadays 50% of the people in the Netherlands declare themselves uh, the not belonging to any religion. Meanwhile, 23% declare themselves uh, Catholics, about 18% uh, uh, Protestants, and maybe 5% uh, Muslim. Do you use e-bikes? Uh, they use e-bikes in the Netherlands. Yes, definitely. They, they do everything by bike, honestly. They, they use it a lot. Do many people in Amsterdam speak English? I would certainly try to learn some Dutch before going, but wondering if you can get around without knowing the language. Absolutely, everybody, almost everybody speaks English in the Netherlands. They're very clever with languages. Uh, you say a woman could leave the convent whenever she wanted due to the liberality of the church or did she have to consult with her father first? What period was this and what freedom did women have? So the, um, the women in the Big Einhof, uh, as I said, they were not nuns. It was a sisterhood uh, belonging to the Catholic uh, uh, church. The time was uh, 13th, 14th century. Um, so they were free to leave. Uh, the important thing is that when they were leaving there, they were respecting the rules that they were given, but they weren't nuns. So they were free to leave uh, whenever they, they wanted uh, for whatever reason, maybe because they got married with somebody for whatever reason, they weren't forced to, to stay. And they also weren't forced to go. Eh? For many women, it was uh, their own choice. When you say cheese is very, very old, how old do you mean? Uh, well, maybe 20, 30 years, uh, depends on the variety of cheese. Eh? Some of them can be very old, uh, but I don't know how tasty they would be. Uh, what was the name of the book that you recommend? Uh, uh, okay, Russell Shorter uh, is the name of the author. Oh, hold on. When we were at the Night Watch about a year and a half ago, it was covered by a scanner for a project to inspect the under layers of the canvas. Do you know anything about what they found? No, actually not. I'm not a bit updated on it, but uh, I can Google it for you and I can, uh, or I can ask some uh, local guides. Uh, they, for sure, they will know the answer. I am not updated on it, but I, I know what you mean. Um, where, uh, no, sorry, what is the history? of uh, the red light, the, the, well, it was uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, the, the prostitutes uh, since the 80s uh, started fighting to have their profession legalized. Actually, even back in the 19th century, and not only in the Netherlands, uh, but very often, uh, wherever there were prostitutes or places where people would go to the prostitutes, the red, red light uh, was the symbol of of uh, uh, the houses of the prostitutes. Um, you glazed over the fact that the Dutch were 
complicit in sending Jews to the camp. No, sorry, yeah, you're right. Why did you not give this fact? The refugees like the Franks were often put into atrocious camps in the Netherlands, uh, like Westerhoek. Yes, also Anna Frank spent uh, sometimes in Westerhoek uh, before she and her family were sent uh, to Auschwitz. No, it is true. No, it, it, there is no specific reason, really. Uh, uh, it wasn't meant. Uh, uh, I didn't do it on purpose, let's say. Um, but it is true. Many Dutch people were Collabor uh, how do you say collaborate <laughs> the way cooperating with the Nazi and many of the Dutch uh, people also betrayed uh, the Jews uh, uh, causing uh, uh, this uh, you know awful salvation of the Jewish population in the Netherlands. It is absolutely true. I mentioned uh, maybe, I, I did mention uh, that uh, many Jews had also to pay when they were hiding. Uh, uh, many of them had to pay and they weren't uh, even treated well. Uh, they were given very little food. There's awful stories related to this. Um, where does the uh, word Dutch come from? Okay, we said that this session is on job. I was in Amsterdam three years ago. At the restaurant, I left 20% of the tip. Ah, oh, wait. Ah, sorry. I just lost this. Uh, I, I will never know. You left 20% of the tip. Yone, and... the question is that the woman left 20% as a tip. Yeah. Uh, as we do in the United States. But the waitress or waiter looked at her with a lot of surprise. Why? What is tipping like? Ah. Yeah, because 20% of tip is quite a lot in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so she was probably very happy. Uh, what are the Dutch doing to combat the rising seas related to global warming? Uh, building dikes. Dutch are busy with water always. Uh, they are always alert, they are constantly monitoring, uh, checking. They have many governmental institutions that take care about the water, or private organization, universities, uh, um, engineers, uh, they are constantly, it is their main uh, thing, obviously, for obvious reason. Uh, I appreciate all the Jewish history. Are there synagogues operating today? Yes, they are. Please spell the tour to see the tulip spring bulbs. Thank you. So that's Kirkenhof, K-E-U-K-E-N-H-O-F. Kirken means kitchen in Dutch, Kirkenhof in Lisse, L-I-S-S-E. That's the name of the place. Uh, love the summer Amsterdam by Maggie McNeil. Would love to learn more about it. I, I'm sorry, but I don't know this song. What is the best time to see the tulips? Uh, again, April or May. Is English widely spoken? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it was a lovely tour, thank you. <laughs> uh, houseboats in the winter stay uh, as simple uh, as uh, that. They stay where they are, they don't go anywhere. Uh, how long would you recommend staying uh, to get a relaxed space but complete experience? In Amsterdam, uh, I don't think uh, you would get bored if you spend at least seven days, but of course you can see the highlights also in two days. 
but uh, with seven days you can experience uh, the city at a very relaxing pace. I mean, the city is very small, so you can walk from one side to the other, or you can bike, or you can use the trams, the transportation system is very, very good. So the, the, the logistics uh, are easy, huh? but um, uh, Amsterdam is also a very crowded city. Uh, to get into a museum, uh, it can be challenging. Um, I haven't mentioned this, but for some museums, you really need a reservation unless you don't want to stay uh, outside in the queue for two hours. Huh? Uh, if you're lucky, you might get in, or if you go at specific times, especially at lunchtime, it's a little quiet, but Anne Frank and Vincent van Gogh Museum mostly are the most visited museum in Amsterdam. So you, you do want to have a reservation when you get there. Uh, how long in that, real life? Yone, a follow-up to that question. How long in real life would it take to go on all the stops that we did today on a bike tour? Um, I mean, it depends if we also have to visit all the museums that I've mentioned, this would not be possible to do in, in one day, obviously. Uh, um, maybe you shall need something like three or four days. But if you only are biking uh, on the same uh, path we did together, what it would take you? Maybe a couple of hours? Not even, maybe one and a half hours or something like that. Are you a knitter? No, I'm not, unfortunately. Have you been to Stephen and Penelope in Amsterdam? No, I haven't, but now I'm curious. Uh, what, what, where would you recommend to visit for hikers, outdoor enthusiasts? Well. Dutch people are all outdoor enthusiasts. Uh, hiking, uh, so there are no mountains <laughs> in the Netherlands, so you can walk, uh, but it's all flat. So you cannot go climbing anywhere, uh, but you can go close to Amsterdam, there's beautiful beach. Uh, there's actually a, a, a sort of a natural reservat in Sandfort, uh, which is the closest beach uh, to Amsterdam, it's about 20 minutes by train. And if you go north, uh, you can take a very uh, amazing experience at the Wadensee, where you can uh, walk uh, through, the, um, to the, through the sea that has a very, that is not at all high. So you can walk on it and sometimes in some times of the year, you can even reach the islands by, uh, on by foot. Um, are there high rise buildings in the Netherlands? Uh, no, not really. There is no, uh, some, uh, there's nothing like Eiffel Towers or something like that. You can have excellent views. Uh, there is uh, nearby the central station, there are a few modern hotels, the Hilton Hotel and also the public library, which is beautiful, it's gorgeous. And those buildings are quite high and they give you a beautiful uh, view of uh, the city. Uh, that picture I took of the BIM house, I took it for the Moving Peak Hotel, which was close by Central Station, which was, which is also a relatively high building, uh, but nothing like uh, uh, the Eiffel Towers or something like that. Um, are the seasons in Amsterdam? Yes, winter with ice and snow. Well, ice and snow. Not really every year, as I was mentioning, this ice uh, competition of health and state and talk, it's not happening since 1997 because of the global warming. But yeah, winter is cold, so they, they do get some snow. It is more difficult to get uh, the freezing temperature for the ice to stay. But it is definitely cold in the winter. Then there's the spring with the tulips, summers, Summer can be very hot uh, and most of all they can be very humid and the level of the humidity in the Netherlands uh, 
having water all around you, sometimes it's uh, kind of unbearable. It makes you feel quite tired, <laughs> but the weather is nice. So it is very enjoyable in the summer as well. And also autumn is a beautiful season. Now, if you go in parks and so on, you can see all these beautiful leaves uh, with the orange purple colors everywhere. Yeah, these seasons are very well defined in the Netherlands. Two questions. How long distance is the bike tour you discuss? Okay. And how prevalent is helmet wearing among cyclists in the Netherlands? Uh, well, so they don't wear an helmet. But if you're not Dutch or if you don't live in Amsterdam, I strongly recommend you to wear a helmet. I do. I do because I don't trust that. It's, the, it's a little bit of a crazy way of uh, riding the bicycle. Well, they say I have the crazy way of driving in the car, which is true because I'm Italian. If you just want a real coffee in Amsterdam, how do you ask in Amsterdam? But you don't find a real coffee in Amsterdam. For that, you have to come to Italy. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. So no, the real coffee, uh, mach, ich, mach ich, can I have a coffee? Coffee is coffee. Ah, maybe you mean oh, a, no, real, no. a real uh, coffee because <laughs> not, not a, in a coffee shop. So in, in the Netherlands, it's easy. Coffee shops are, only play, cof, cof, places where they sell drugs, okay? No, I mean, you can also buy a coffee in the coffee shop. You can't buy alcohol in the coffee shop. It's going to be a very smelly coffee, but it, you can still get some coffee in the coffee shop. But if you don't want to have uh, the smelling experience, then you go to a cafe. Uh, what are the usual fees for entrance to museums? Uh, it depends on which museum you go. I would say around 20 euros, but it depends a little bit on the age and, and where. Uh, where are the windmills that are open for tours uh, located? The Schanze Schanze is really half an hour away from Amsterdam. It's very close to Amsterdam. Uh, how come the ice skating competition ended in 1997? Are there plans to bring it back? No, it didn't end. Uh, they still, every year, they hope uh, that they will have enough ice to do it, but it's just not happening because it's not uh, cold enough. But they are ready. Whenever the ice comes, they are all ready and enthusiastic about it. What would you think is an ideal number of days to spend in Amsterdam? I have the luxury of time, that's good for you. So I would spend there also a couple of weeks, why not? Because from Amsterdam, you could also take all these day trips around. So there's so many things to do. Uh, and also by train eh, from Amsterdam, you can move to some other beautiful uh, Dutch cities. I mean, I haven't mentioned uh, Utrecht, I haven't mentioned Harlem, Maastricht, uh, Rotterdam, uh, paradise for architecture lovers. There's so, so much to do and to see. And all these cities are maybe one or maximum two hours uh, driving from Amsterdam. So if you spend time, if you spend two or three weeks there, you can basically visit uh, all over the, the country. What neighborhood do you suggest for somebody who wants to live in Amsterdam for a year or so? What is the average rental price for a flat? That is very expensive. Um, there is a shortage of houses in Amsterdam. As I was telling you, there's so many people living in the city and so less space. Uh, one bedroom student room uh, would cost you 500 euros per month. And I'm talking about just one bedroom 
with a shared bathroom with other students and a little small tiny um, kitchen for yourself. Uh, uh, you can uh, pay up to 2,000 euros uh, per month uh, for a normal size apartment. And it depends on the area. Uh, all the areas I've mentioned on this tour, they are extremely expensive because they are right in the center of the city. The tour that we took today, uh, it is a tour of the city center. If you moved a little bit outside, you find great neighborhoods such as the Pipe, uh, which is full of cafes, is more suitable maybe for young people. Um, otherwise, um, let me think, uh, Amsterdam South, uh, it's also very beautiful. Uh, I didn't have time to mention also, uh, there, is, there are a lot of parks in Amsterdam, beautiful parks like Vondel Park, uh, where uh, it's beautiful to spend some time as well. Uh, have the canals ever flooded? I don't know about that, but thanks for asking because I can find out. I don't think so, really. I mean, at least in Amsterdam, I am not sure, but I don't think so. Uh, I'll ask my husband, <laughs> I don't know if he knows. Um, when traveling around the Netherlands, are there taxis? Yes. I know most ride bikes. No, no, but uh, he rode across America on his bike. You have a friend in Limburg. Yes. No, no, no. There is taxis, of course. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, 1972, I was in Amsterdam and went to a pink church called Paradiso, which was a disco nightclub music club. Do you know the history of Paradiso and if it's still in existence? Paradiso uh, nowadays uh, with this crisis uh, has been uh, shut down and uh, I think they're very close to bankrupt. Uh, uh, yeah, I did. Now it is just a crazy moment, uh, obviously, uh, for all these uh, places. We all hope uh, they will come back uh, as soon as people will be able to go. But Paradiso, good one. What is the name of the church in Jordan district where Rembrandt is uh, buried in a secret grave? Um, the Western Church, Westerkerk, Western Church. Gaila Scott, hello Gaila. Is the cost of living high in Amsterdam? Yes, it is, unfortunately. Uh, what is your must eat when we visit? Uh, I am a big fan of herrings, but not many people like it. <laughs> yeah, Mara doesn't like it. Mara, it's very healthy food. You, you should uh, review <laughs> your no, okay, no herrings for Mara. Yammer, they say in Dutch. P pity, pity. Uh, how are the houseboats managed? Do you rent a mooring space? Uh, buy one like real estate? You no, know, you rent a mooring place and it is very expensive. How long have you lived in the Netherlands? I lived there for uh, almost a six and a half years. Um, do they grow or produce all their own food or is it important that they grow most of their food and they export it as well they have these perfectly red round shaped tomatoes they look like if they're made of plastic they're beautiful but they, to me and I'm so spoiled with tomatoes in Italy they never taste like a real tomato, but they are beautiful and they are exported all over the world. Uh, in winter, do you need a machine to make air bubbles around the hull of the boat so that the ice doesn't damage the hull? Mm, I think some do, yeah, especially when, the, when they have lots of ice. I'm pretty sure these questions come from a Canadian. I think so. <laughs> um, 
Do you know anything yeah. about the diamond trade? That's there's a lot of um, history. The diamonds. Yeah, diamonds. Yeah, the, yeah, the diamonds. Of course, yes, there are uh, many diamond shop. There is even a diamond museum. Yes, I forgot to mention it. It's close to um, the Rijksmuseum. There's a very famous shop for diamonds because diamond cutting uh, was uh, a very big uh, um, activity, commercial activity in the Netherlands. Yes, absolutely. If we were to do a week in the Netherlands, where would you visit for how many days? each place well you need for amsterdam you need at least uh, a couple of days two or three days and then you could do one day in delft uh, you could do um, one day excursion to utrecht you could do another day excursion to harlem and the seaside Another question I see is, um, who started the Van Gogh mu Museum? Um, so the Van Gogh Museum was started, the, the, the most of the work was done by Jo um, Van Gogh. She was the uh, wife of uh, Vincent Van Gogh's brother, Theo. Uh, when Vincent died, his brother Theo went immediately busy with uh, collecting all his artwork and making it available, you know, for us, also selling it, but also collecting it for exhibitions. But Theo also died shortly after that Vincent died. So the work was carried out uh, uh, by his wife, Jo. She was very important in collecting the Van Gogh artwork. I'm actually just kind of going ahead to see if there's questions that haven't been asked. Um, I think we're almost at the end. I'm going to pick a couple more and then we're going to finish up if that's okay with you. Yes, yeah, sure. Can you give us any history about the apple strudel there? Does that have to do with the apple a day keeps the doctor away? The apple strope or the, uh, the apple strudel? The apple tart. Ah, the apple cake. The yeah. apple cake. Tart. Uh, the apple, Dutch apple tart is the best. The, don't bother with the French, uh, sorry, no offense to anybody, but uh, Dutch apple tart is the best. Now the story, I don't know. I just know I, I'm crazy for Dutch apple tart. It's, can, you, can you reiterate the story about the hook at the top of the house? The, the? The, the, the really, hook, yes. Yeah, the yeah. Hook. Well, the hook, uh, because basically these buildings uh, from outside they seem very big, but inside uh, they're very small uh, because they're not uh, so wide, uh, uh, they're quite tight uh, in the width. And so um, they couldn't carry their, in the, back in the days in the 1600s, uh, they had big cases of goods that had to be stored in the, in the, um, in the top floors and they couldn't carry it through the staircases. It was too complicated and mm -hmm. also dangerous because you could broke things. So it was much easier to pull up through a rope, thanks to this hook on the top of the building to pull up the, the cases, it was safer. And still nowadays they do that with uh, their furniture. Many times you see if somebody is moving in somewhere, they would pull up their furniture from, from the outside because from the inside it's very, very difficult. It's very narrow. Okay, so one more. Um, and this is a personal question for you and even your husband, if he wants to chime in. What is your one thing you would never miss or you don't want people to miss if they were to visit the Netherlands and specifically Amsterdam? What is the one must see? You should see in Amsterdam, you have to see the gezelligheid, the coziness the canals 
uh, the warehouses, the houseboats, uh, uh, even if there aren't big monuments or big, you know, famous things to see, but just experience uh, that neighborhood and experience uh, the energy of it and maybe sitting in a cafe and spotting people on their bikes looking at the mothers bringing their children three or four of them on one bike i mean they look like a christmas tree you don't know how, how do they do that I, I would be in the hospital me and my son and my daughter after three minutes you know, that experiencing it and being, uh, you know, amazed and surprised of the tiny little things. Uh, Dutch uh, like the tiny little things. I think that's awesome. And I do think that, Yane, you did bring us the spirit of the tiny little things, the culture that makes up Amsterdam and the Dutch. So thank you so very much. And thank you, everybody, for joining and us tonight. Ciao, Lisa. I see yeah. Lisa. Kisses. Everybody, good good night, good good afternoon, and we will see you next week. Take care.